Hello, my name's Abigail. Welcome to Philosophy Tube, a show about ideas. At time of recording, the Canadian Senate is considering a bill that, on the face of it, doesn't seem too major. Bill S233 calls for the government to establish a framework for studying the possibility of a universal basic income program in Canada. So, not doing something not planning to do something, just establishing a framework to study the possibility of maybe doing something someday in Canada. However, the Canadian Senate has been inundated with tens of thousands of calls, emails and handwritten letters from people saying this is the beginning of the end. People are falsely claiming that this is the first step in a global socialist takeover, or they're going to use it to deny pensions to unvaccinated people, or that they're going to use it to unleash transhumanism. And this is our subject for today. Something that was once called the world's most dangerous idea. We're going to learn what transhumanism is and why some people are so angry about it. As always, if you enjoyed the performance, you can sign up at patreon.com slash philosophytube to pledge a couple of dollars a month to support free education and join the cyborg future. So swallow your soma pills, align your Bokonovsky apparatuses, and welcome to the show. First things first, this is an educational program. So let's start by learning what transhumanism actually is. A rough description would be, it's the philosophical study of technology that might enable us to go beyond current human limitations. Transhumanist philosophers write about medicine and cognitive enhancement, genetic engineering, cloning, artificial intelligence, uploading your mind into a computer. The Oxford Online Dictionary defines transhumanism as I have merged my consciousness with the online dictionary and evolved beyond the need for puny human definitions. Millions of years before Homo sapiens evolved, earlier hominins like Homo habilis were using stone tools. The Neanderthals had primitive technology like clothing, weapons and the iPod Nano. The two really big technologies, language and fire, were around before us and indeed shaped our evolution. In a very real sense, we've always been technologically augmented. So transhumanists just ask, how far can we push it? Transhumanists want to apply technology to overcome limits imposed by our biological and genetic heritage. Transhumanists regard human nature not as an end in itself, not as perfect, and not as having any claim on our allegiance. Rather, it is just one point along an evolutionary pathway, and we can learn to reshape our own nature in ways we deem desirable and valuable. By thoughtfully, carefully, and yet boldly applying technology to ourselves, we can become something no longer accurately described as human. We can become post-human. Here's a little example, so you can get a taste. The philosopher David de Grazia imagines a woman called Marina, who has anxieties and insecurities and is unhappy in herself. Marina wants to take the antidepressant Prozac because she's heard it can make people more confident, even if they don't have a mental illness. So she wants to use a drug, which is a kind of edible technology, to transform herself and go beyond her limitations. De Grazia asks, what do we think here? Is it okay? Is she still the same person afterwards? And what he's really getting at is, what is your authentic self? Marina decides that her insecurities are not a core part of who she is. They're actually getting in the way of who she is. We might say she does not 
identify with those feelings. So she uses technology to get rid of them. De Grazia says that means the self, the human subject, is not fixed and given to us, but that actually self-creation is part of what we do. Wow, what an amazing hypothetical science fiction scenario. The point is, transhumanist philosophers think not just about the technology of tomorrow, but also what technology could tell us about ourselves today. Modern transhumanism got going in the 1990s, when the economy existed and it wasn't uncomfortable to talk about how you like Harry Potter. And reflecting that era, a lot of transhumanist writing is quite optimistic. It's uh, refreshing, almost quaint to hear people talking about how the future is going to be better. The actual word transhumanism was popularized in the 50s by British biologist Julian Huxley, who saw that so many people are forced to live worse lives than they need to and never reach their full potential. Huxley thought that with the right application of science and reason, we could solve problems like poverty or preventable illness. It is as if man had been suddenly appointed managing director of the biggest business of all, the business of evolution. Appointed without being asked if he wanted it and without proper warning and preparation, what is more, he can't refuse the job. Whether he wants to or not, whether he's conscious of what he's doing or not, he is, in point of fact, determining the future direction of evolution on this earth. That is his inescapable destiny. And the sooner he realizes it and starts believing in it, the better for all concerned. Huxley's work is grounded in this real desire to make the world a better place. But at the same time, he was also a eugenicist. Even after World War II, there were a lot of people like him who condemned Nazi eugenics, but thought it could have worked if they'd done it right. There is an inspiring optimism to his essay, but in my opinion, there's also something slightly sinister about comparing evolution to a business, something you can be fired from if you don't contribute. Julian Huxley was the brother of Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, so... Christmas dinner must have been a little tense around their house. Reflecting this tension, a common question that transhumanists and their critics grapple with is, who decides what counts as enhancement and limitation? The usual answer is that it's just personal choice. If Marina decides that her anxieties are limiting her, well then she can enhance herself. But we know, don't we, that when it comes to tech, things can sometimes technically be a choice, but in reality compulsory. For example, you don't have to have an internet connection, but good luck applying for a job if you don't. Maybe worth bearing that sort of thing in mind when we're thinking about cognitive enhancements or genetic engineering. Maybe that's where those angry Canadians are coming from. A lot of people are made uneasy by the idea of transhumanism. And maybe some of that unease comes from the suspicion that tech can be more than it seems. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the technology that changes human beings. We sometimes think that technology is essentially neutral. It can have good or bad effects, and it might be really important who controls it, but a tool, many people like to think, is just a tool. Guns don't kill people, people do. But some philosophers have argued that technology can have values built into it that we may not realize. The classic example is overpasses in New York that were designed in the 1920s by architect Robert Moses. Allegedly, Moses deliberately built the overpasses too low for buses to get under. And since buses were more likely to carry low-income people of color, that meant they couldn't get to the places that white residents wanted to keep segregated. Now that story might not actually be historically accurate, but it contains the germ of an interesting idea. The philosopher Don Idy says tech can open or close possibilities. It's not just about its function or who controls it. 
He says technology can provide a framework for action. Assuming for the sake of argument that the Robert Moses story was true, the overpass helps shape society according to the values of its designer. We could take this idea one step further actually, and say that technology also provides a framework for different kinds of subjects, people, to exist. Consider something like modern contraception, which allows people reliable control over when they become pregnant. The tech allows you to make a choice. And suddenly the old way of doing things, where women in particular were just expected to be baby factories, becomes one option rather than the way things have to be. In a manner of speaking, we might say that the modern feminist subject who makes choices about her own body is enabled by technology. That's quite a lofty thing to grasp, so here's some more examples. Some writers have talked about how the design of social media can make you behave like an asshole, even if you don't mean to. The philosopher Heather Widows talks about how beauty technology and cosmetic surgery creates pressure to be a different kind of woman now than was possible 50 years ago. And God knows that as the technology of medical transition has developed, it's opened up very different ways of being a transgender subject. Testosterone blockers, for example, are a kind of technology that just wasn't available to trans people 100 years ago, but which make me at least happier, kinder, more intelligent. We might say enhanced compared to what I was before, unless I miss a dose and then I wake up feeling like venom. Abby, we must eat everything in the fridge. Shut up, testosterone. All right, so we've got this theory that tech can open or close possibilities, provide a framework for action and being, but how exactly could it do that? We can go into depth here by looking at the work of philosopher Martin Heidegger. Now, some of you are going, Heidegger? Wasn't Heidegger a... Uh... Yes, yes he was. Don't spoil it for those who don't know. We will come back to that. For now, I'm gonna encrypt that secret data about Martin Heidegger and encode it in this envelope. We'll come back to that later. Heidegger's work on technology fits in with a tradition in philosophy called phenomenology, which is all about focusing on what you experience. And I think the best way of explaining it is to do a little demonstration. It's one that we've used on the show before, and it'll help you grasp what we're talking about. So check this out. Okie dokie, go for a little walk around me, and viewers at home, keep your eyes on the hammer. Now then, did you at any point see the entire hammer? No, you didn't. Your eyes can only ever see one side of it at a time. And there was even a moment where you lost sight of it because it was behind me. But in your mind's eye, you experience it as one complete object that is continually present. What's interesting too, is you don't have to make a rational argument to do that. You don't go, I can see a hammer. I can still see a hammer. Therefore, it is one object that is continually present. You just experience it as one thing. You can't help it. You also can't help but see it as a hammer for hammering things. It's not just a lump of metal and rubber. It has a function that you recognize as part of your experience of it. Maybe you also experience it as a hammer that looks cheap or nasty or dirty. We've learned something interesting here which is that we don't just experience the world as a stream of inputs, we experience it as having functions and values and stories, if you like. The philosopher Edmund Husserl put it like this. This world is not there for me as a mere world of facts and affairs, 
but with the same immediacy as a world of values, a world of goods, a practical world. Without further effort on my part, I find the things before me furnished not only with the qualities that benefit their positive nature, but with value characters, such as beautiful or ugly, agreeable or disagreeable, pleasant or unpleasant, and so forth. Things in their immediacy stand there as objects to be used. The table with its books, the glass to drink from, the vase, the piano, and so forth. The same considerations apply, of course, just as well to the men and beasts in my surroundings as to mere things. They are my friends or my foes, my servants or superiors, strangers, relatives, and so forth. Martin Heidegger was a student of Husserl's and he wrote about the ways that we experience the world when we use a piece of technology. His most famous example was a hammer. He says when you use one, you don't even think about the hammer. You focus on the nail. The hammer almost disappears in your experience and you just focus on the task that needs to be performed. Another example might be a keyboard. Once you get proficient at typing, you almost stop experiencing the keyboard. Instead, your primary experience is just of the words that you're typing on the screen. It's only when it breaks or it doesn't do what we want it to do that it really becomes visible as a piece of technology. The rest of the time, it's just the medium through which we experience the world. Heidegger talks about technology withdrawing from our attention. Others say that technology becomes transparent. We don't experience it we experience the world through it. Heidegger says that technology comes with its own way of seeing. The philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty took this one step further. He imagines a woman who wears a delicate feather in her hat. And after walking around for a while, she doesn't need to measure a doorway every time to check if she can get through. She actually incorporates the feather into her mental hitbox, her sense of how big she is. Her experience of her own body is extended by an object. He says the same thing happens when you drive a car. Once you're reasonably proficient at driving, you can feel how big the car is and whether or not you're going to get through a gap without having to get out and check. Have you ever heard a driver talk about how they can feel the road? Or a scuba diver say that once they're underwater, they forget they've got all the kit on. That's the technology becoming semi-transparent. You've actually been staring at a really good example this whole video. Acrylic nails. When I wear nail extensions, I almost forget that I've got them on, but I have to change how I interact with objects and how I move my hair as I adopt the nail's way of seeing. And I like it. Part of the fun of technology is the opportunities it gives us for different sorts of embodiment. Ask any woman who owns a strap-on. I'm not even kidding. That's another really good example. Now, some of you are looking at me like, bullshit. A person using a hammer is just a person using a hammer. But there might actually be some evidence from neurology to support this. If you give a monkey a rake that it has to use to reach a piece of food, then the neurons in its brain that fire when there's a visual stimulus near its hand start firing when there's a stimulus near the end of the rake too. The monkey's brain extends its sense of the monkey body to include the tool. And now here's the final step. The philosopher Bruno Latour says that when this happens, when the technology becomes transparent enough to get incorporated into our sense of self and our experience of the world, a new compound entity is formed. A person using a hammer is actually a new subject with its own way of seeing. Hammer man. That's how technology provides a framework for action and being. Rake plus monkey equals rake monkey. Makeup plus girl is makeup girl. And makeup girl experiences the world differently, has a different kind of subjectivity because the tech lends us its way of seeing. You think guns don't kill people, people do? Well, gun plus man creates a new entity with new possibilities for experience and action. Gun man. Oh no, a gun man! Oh, I'm gonna stab you. So, if we're on to something here, 
with this idea that tech can withdraw from our attention and in so doing create new subjects with new ways of seeing, then it makes sense to ask when a new piece of technology comes along, what kind of people will this turn us into? Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. It's awesome to be here. Kelly, I've got to say right off the bat, you're looking very put together. Oh, thank you. I mean, I interview a lot of tech company CEOs and a lot of them, you know, they've got scraggly beards or they're wearing jeans and a turtleneck. Uh, trying to be Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, exactly. <laughs> but you're known for putting a bit more thought into your image. Oh, I'm sure you say that to all the girls. Just putting you at ease. Okay, so your company is the hot new startup, started in Silicon Valley, quintupled your revenue in the last year, and now you're everywhere. Tell us about it. We're called Express, X-P-R-S, and we provide facial recognition software with a smile. So FaceTrack is a huge market right now because it's the future of security, right? You already use your face to unlock your phone, but soon you'll be able to use your face to unlock your car or your bank account or to make purchases. So we took the next step, right? Because the most interesting thing about a face isn't who does it belong to, it's what is it doing? Is the face I'm looking at happy or sad or bored? What does it express? And your software can actually tell what mood someone is in by their facial expression? That's right. We unlock the power of machine learning and artificial intelligence to read a facial expression. Our software can detect up to 200 metrics on the face. 200? Yeah. And our intelligence system assigns each face an express rating based on three categories. Honesty, attention, and positivity. Honesty, so you can tell if someone's lying? When a face is being dishonest or holding something back, it often shows little micro expressions and our software can detect those. And we can also tell if a face is giving you its full attention or if the thoughts are elsewhere. And what kind of situations is it used in? Classrooms and lecture halls are two of our big target use cases. Like if you're teaching a class on Zoom and you wanna know are faces tuning in or are they looking away? Also in the office, like if you're giving a presentation or a, a job interview, targeted advertising, borders, prisons, law enforcement operations, that sort of thing. Targeted advertising? Yeah, so if a face sees an ad, our software can tell, did the face enjoy it, did it not? And that way, advertisers can improve user experience. And how accurate is it? Our express ratings are pretty accurate. Our machine learning is some of the best on the market right now. Right, because your company came out of nowhere. Lots of people have tried to do similar things, but you've managed it much more effectively and cheaper than anyone else. Thank you for noticing. Now we are ready to go back to the angry Canadians we opened with. Unfortunately, transhumanism is suffering a similar fate to critical race theory, in that it is an interesting field in its own right, but a lot of the people talking about it aren't actually talking about it. It's becoming the subject of an increasing number of right-wing conspiracy theories. The most important thing to realize about conspiracy theories is they try to express something emotionally rather than say anything about how the world is. For example, if I go to a NASA conference and I say, I think the Earth is 93 million miles away from the sun. Well, then I'm trying to say something about how the world is. Then we can talk about evidence and measurement and truth and objective reality. But if you and I go on a date to the movies and I say, I think I enjoyed that film. That's more of a subjective thing. I'm expressing how I feel, inviting you to express how you feel, facilitating some kind of social interaction between us. If you start talking about, well, how can you prove it was a good film? Where's your evidence? What are your measurements? Then you've kind of missed the point of what I'm doing. Conspiracy theories are that second kind of sentence dressed up as the first one. That's why the details of the conspiracy are often so fluid and fast changing and why believers are seemingly immune to evidence. It's an opinion dressed up as a fact 
in whatever language gets clicks and resonates with the target audience. For example, Dan Olson from the channel Folding Ideas has a great video on flat earthers. Flat earthers make a lot of outlandish claims about the shape of the world, and it's tempting to see it as if it's just a fringe scientific theory. But what Dan shows is that a lot of the people spreading that idea are actually hardcore political Christians. He describes how one chat room recommended performing an experiment that shows the world is flat. So Dan performed the experiment, and of course, it shows that the world is round. And when he presented this evidence, they said, go away and pray. It's not really about the shape of the earth. It's them expressing their opinion that God made earth special and Christians are persecuted for knowing it. As research for this episode, I read some very energetic writing by people who said that globalists are secretly planning to merge human beings with technology in order to put us under complete surveillance or completely control our lives or abolish the family. And it's uh, the, 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 not everyone's gonna go along with it though. So they're also planning to depopulate the planet and kill everyone who won't obey by using poison vaccines. And it's the Great Reset, New World Order. And they're gonna build a giant artificially intelligent computer in the shape of a golden calf. And that's gonna be like that fake 666 God, and then when they turn it on, it's gonna be Satan. And I was like, whoa, even the Antichrist's job is getting automated these days. There's the emotional opinion being expressed, and then there's the conspiracy costume that it gets dressed up in. And transhumanism makes a great conspiracy costume. There's always a lot of tech news, so you can rip stuff straight from the headlines about Elon Musk putting computers in monkeys, and it'll get clicks. It's also not explicitly religious or racial. If you just come out the gate and say, Jews are planning to exterminate Christian white people, then a lot of folks will go, yeah, all right, on your bike, Adolf. But if you frame it as elites are planning transhumanism, then at least some people will go, wait, really? And you can always add the hardcore stuff later once you've got their attention. This is happening a lot with transphobia. There are people who claim that the trans rights movement is just the first stage in a Jewish billionaire plot to merge humans with computers. And the more extreme versions of that conspiracy just get laughed off. But watered down versions do spread. In my country, there are mainstream respected writers who've said in print that the trans rights movement is just being artificially funded by George Soros. That's an anti-Semitic conspiracy theory about transhumanism entering the mainstream using transphobia as the gateway drug. Speaking of threats from the right, another place that transhumanism conspiracies show up is the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. Part of the ideology behind the Russian invasion is this idea of Novorussia, New Russia. Russia needs to be the center of a new cultural and political Eurasian empire. And part of this Novorussia idea is the belief that Russia has to step up and do this because the West is decadent and effeminate and unholy. And if you go down the rabbit hole, that we are secretly ruled by elites who are planning transhumanism. There's a Russian philosopher called Alexander Dugin, and he's kind of like if Jordan Peterson went through the black hole from Event Horizon. He's a big proponent of this Novorussia idea. His work has apparently been quite influential amongst senior Russian military. And one of the things he says is that the West is trying to do transhumanism. In the West, there is already no longer any religion, political hierarchies, normal families, or state in the fullest sense of the word. All borders have been completely crossed, transgressed, now all that remains is one final step, overcoming the boundaries of the human species itself. Now, who knows how much of that is sincere and how much is him just saying whatever he needs to justify his political views. But it's interesting and maybe important to realize that the Russian far right and the English speaking far right are singing from the same hymn sheet here, especially when it comes to transhumanism and indeed trans people. Where we're going, we won't need eyes to see. And do you know who else was singing from that hymn sheet? That's right, baby. It's time to hack this envelope and decrypt the secret data about Martin Heidegger.
Heidegger was a f***ing Nazi. Martin Heidegger joined the Nazi party in 1933. He used his academic position to persecute Jewish students and even reported some of his own colleagues, the Gestapo. In the 20th century, there was a bit of debate about, oh, well, maybe he was forced to do that to save his own skin. But in more recent years, his personal notebooks have been translated and there is no longer any question. Even the Heidegger Institute in Germany, the big Heidegger stands are like, yeah, uh, well, he was right about a lot of things, but uh, he was Reich about a lot of things too. Like a lot of intellectuals in the 1920s, Heidegger thought that the world had reached a crisis point, politically, economically, morally. Religion has lost its sway over society. There's all this new technology that's dehumanizing people. So he thought we needed a new vision of what it means to exist in the modern age. His most famous book, Being and Time, the one that contains the hammer example, was his attempt to supply the intellectual foundations of progress. And his idea of progress required a new Germany to take over Europe, eliminate democracy, and kill all the bad people, especially Jews, but also people like me. When he said that technology can dehumanize us, he thought that was happening as part of a worldwide Jewish conspiracy. Did you fix this then, buddy? Yes, I fixed it! Did you? So parts are Jewish. What parts in a car are Jewish? Hmm? Uh, spark plugs? Spark plugs. The Jews invented spark plugs to control global traffic. So what on earth is going on here? Transhumanism and technological advancement is the conspiracy costume for all these different groups of people from Russian generals to Nazi philosophers to Canadian truckers. But what is the emotional opinion that they are trying to express? This is the fun bit. This is my favorite bit of the video. If you can grasp what I'm about to offer you, then a lot of philosophy, especially from the last 60 years or so, will open up to you. I want you to try and imagine that an idea, a concept like freedom, justice, gender, whatever, is a piece of technology, a kind of mental tool. An idea serves some function. It focuses our attention. We might even say that some ideas come with their own way of seeing and even shape the subjects that use them. And just like a tool, an idea can withdraw or become transparent. We often don't think about how they work or where they come from until they go wrong. Now you're thinking like a philosopher. Now you're reflecting Heidegger's own ideas back at him like it's Yu-Gi-Oh. It's not just philosophy, it's philosophy tube. Transhumanism often uses this idea of progress. And some of its critics say that some big questions get forgotten about when that concept becomes transparent. For example, there are writers like Ray Kurzweil, who says that nanotechnology is gonna let us eliminate poverty and cure disease and then we'll have clean energy and it'll all be fantastic. And we already know how to make clean energy. We have enough resources to feed everybody. We could probably cure a lot of diseases if we really wanted to. The question that's being forgotten about here is, why haven't we done all of that already? Another big question is, who's gonna get to use all of this new technology? Most writers say that enhancement tech should be available to everyone, but just saying that doesn't guarantee it's gonna happen. Some say that in the last century, technology has doubled average life expectancy, so, Imagine what we could do if we keep going. And it's like, well, whose life expectancy got doubled? Because in my country, the average life expectancy recently went down in the most economically deprived areas. We could talk about giving people robot limbs that they can control with their brains. And there are a lot of amazing possibilities in that field, but some philosophers of disability have pointed out that disability is not just a physical limitation, it's an economic one too. Disabled is a position that you occupy within the economy relative to things like employment and housing. So overcoming that limitation isn't just about transforming the body. 
You're not going to fix homelessness by turning every homeless person into Inspector Gadget. There are big social and economic questions that are being forgotten about here as well. And this suggests that the real super technology, the real tool that smashes human limitations is just cash. You don't need robot arms. You just need to have bought a house 40 years ago and you're already post-human compared to most humans. Go, go gadget trust fund. If you're a religious person, you might think that there are even bigger questions that are being forgotten about here. The theologian Ronald Cole Turner writes quite thoughtfully about how transhumanists want progress. And what they mean is they want to extend the self, live longer lives, cure disease, upload your mind into the computer. But he says, for Christians, the whole point is to let go of the self and your own desires to better desire God. Also, when he thinks about transformation, he doesn't mean robot arms, he means spiritual salvation. When he gets uploaded to the cloud, he's gonna get uploaded to the f cloud. In my opinion, this is maybe part of why transhumanism can be appealing. It can present this very attractive fantasy in which humanity's problems are just technological. No politics, no religion, just good old neutral science. And I'm not saying all transhumanists are naive. Some of them are aware of this and they do engage with it. I'm just saying it's interesting to see the concept of progress as a piece of technology that comes with its own way of seeing. Maybe that's why transhumanism has become such a bogeyman for the far right. The last few decades of progress have left a lot of people's lives getting worse, not better. And that gives alternative political ideologies a big base from which to recruit. Alexander Dugan says that the concept of modernity is just a tool of elite control. That's how they trick you into supporting their agenda. And the only way to stop them is to become a fascist. Oops, sorry, excuse me, fundamental traditionalist. There's a contemporary fascist slogan, reject modernity, embrace tradition. Because tradition is also a conceptual tool that fascists use to affirm the values of God, church, empire, and of course, racism and patriarchy. Maybe some good news is, it's not just people on the right wing who are starting to realize this. For example, there's a lawyer called Dean Spade who's written quite powerfully about how concepts like progress have been used to advance a pretty narrow vision of LGBT liberation. Gay people in my country can get married, but trans people are still disproportionately likely to be homeless and we still have a segregated healthcare system. When we start asking questions like that, opportunities can present themselves. So, I can fully understand why some people might look around and go, you call this progress, do you? And uh, you say you wanna do more of it? I feel a bit cheesy for asking this, but what's the secret of your success? <laughs> I mean, it's not a secret. We're partnered with Amazon Web Services, so we're able to use the power of their Mechanical Turk platform to assist our software. So the facial recognition is done by people? Our software detects the expression and the crowd workers on Mechanical Turk check and help it. That's so exciting, because those crowd workers are all over the world, aren't they? That's right. Anybody anywhere in the world can help our mission. So long as they have an internet connection, they can log on to Mechanical Turk, look at a picture of a face, and assist our software in detecting the expression. And this kind of work is also the future, right? Because it's so flexible. You can do it from anywhere. You can rate as many faces as you want. And uh, it's giving opportunities to people. Like we have an initiative right now because of the situation in Ukraine uh, to give women in refugee camps the opportunity to assist our software on a flexible basis. And also uh, women in prisons who need 
these jobs uh, are places such as these where people need the opportunities that we're providing. And all of your crowd workers, all of the people that you're recruiting, they're all women. Yeah, yeah, that's a super important part of our mission as a feminist corporation to give opportunities to these disenfranchised women to empower them and make them part of the future because face rec is the future, right? It's just inevitable that things are going that way. and. I knew in my heart when I started out that I had to be part of that future and also to share it with the world. Wow. The future is exciting, huh? As you can tell from today's video, transhumanism is a broad topic. I hope you understand why I haven't come down either way on whether or not it's good. Instead, I hope I've got you thinking about technology and in particular, the ways in which ideas can be technology. That is very much what this show is all about. Speaking of shows, I'm working on something big. The producers won't let me announce it yet, but it's the biggest thing I've ever been involved with and I am unbelievably excited. All I can tell you at the moment is that it's going to be sponsored by two streaming services, Curiosity Stream and Nebula. And you should use the link in the description, curiositystream.com slash philosophytube, to sign up to those streaming services because something is coming. Curiosity Stream are an online streaming platform. They've got thousands of titles about art and science and history. They've also got a little video about transhumanism. I enjoyed it. Maybe you'd like to watch it and apply some of the tools that you learned today. At some point in the future, there is going to be something else on Curiosity Stream, something very cool that my producers won't let me announce. Nebula is also a streaming service that I and a bunch of other creators own a little piece of. There's no ads or algorithms, so it's a great place to put stuff that wouldn't work on YouTube. Stuff like thing that I can't tell you what it is yet, but they do have already a behind the scenes documentary about how Philosophy Tube gets made. If you use that link in the description, you can get a year's worth of Curiosity Stream and Nebula for less than $15. And you should do that because... Yeah! <laughs> I'm so excited. I can't tell you why, but something big is gonna happen. It's potentially a real game changer. I will have further announcements closer to the time and thank you very much for watching. All along the western front People line up to receive She got the power in her hand To shock you like you won't believe Sorry in the Amazon With voltage
We should go to the gym. I mean, we can go to the gym if you want. I must lift weights. That's it. I'm getting an orchidectomy. No! <laughs>